I can smell ice cream six feet away. That's great, Doug. Dougie and I are driving up to pick up a 1970 Barracuda. Now, in my tow truck, I just bought us a brand new tow truck. We had a DVD installed. Dougie and I grew up on horror films. All right, we love the old Frankenstein, Universal Studio stuff, Dracula, Wolfman, even Abbott and Costello. I got one of those DVDs, Meet Frankenstein. And we're having a good time. We take off, got a nice fresh cup of coffee. Everything is fine until Dougie starts being Dougie. We're watching Night of the Living Dead. Let me be clear. Dougie has seen Night of the Living Dead 1,000 times. Is that Barbara? No, it's not Barbara. Well, who is it? I don't know. Johnny? Johnny's dead. Johnny who? Johnny, her brother, the one that says they're coming to get you, Barbara, that we use in the show all the time. <laughs> what? What's she doing now? Who? <laughs> Johnny. Johnny's not a she. How do I know that? Well, this ain't the crying game. Crying game? Who's crying? Who's crying? Is the crying game when he pulls the shirt open and he shows his meat and two veg? I don't know what Mark was talking about, meat and two veg. Uh, I don't know what movie that's from. All I know is I like chocolate brownie thunder ice cream. I wouldn't watch that kind of a movie. You watch worse movies than that. Like Night of the Living Dead. Night of the Living Dead's a great movie. It's a cult classic. If you say anything about it again, you're going to walk through some way to sail. It's my favorite movie. What is? I don't want to walk here. <laughs> You know how exhausting it is? Ask anybody at the shop. Ask Will. Ask, ask the guys in the assembly shop. Ask the camera guys. It's exhausting. You can't win a conversation with them. It's like a virtual game of tic-tac-toe. All right? The very best move is not to play. <laughs> that's from War Games, 1983. Right now, my left arm is going numb. And they'd say that's one of the first signs of a heart attack. And I was perfectly fine an hour ago. I need to check my cholesterol. You know, one of these days, I'm just going to vapor lock right behind the wheel of the truck. We're all going to die. I'm going to have a heart attack. It's going to give out because the blood pressure's through the ceiling. All right? Maybe that'll make him happy. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Buried deep in the Pacific Northwest, one team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible, finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the great award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman, his cousin, Doug, his daughter, Alyssa, his best friend, Royal, his painter, Will, and the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring, resurrecting, and recreating some of the fastest fiercest and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. The good news is I didn't have a heart attack and we made it to the lady's house with the Barracuda. So, one for the kid. So Doug and I are out in Cheshire, Oregon, picking up a 1970 Plymouth Barracuda. I got the strangest call last night from this nice lady that said she had a 70 Barracuda. And she was describing this car, which you never find local cars. You car guys know it. No, there's never anything in your backyard anymore. Everything comes in from tens of thousands of miles away. But she had called and said that she had a 70 Barracuda for a long time and she'd like to sell it. And so I had her describe it to me. And as she was describing it somewhere in my brain, because I know all the Mopars in town or think you do, she bought it from a guy in Venita, had it since 87, and then started to describe the interior to me, I'm thinking, man, there's no way that's, is that any way that's that car? So I, after a few more uh, minutes talking with her, I said, so did you used to live in Springfield? Because if you did, I, my cousin might know you. And she goes, is your cousin Doug Oldham? I said, well, we call him Cousin Dougie. But yes, <laughs> that's him. Okay, so this was so much fun. Mark gets a call from a girl named Heidi with a blue Barracuda for sale. She was engaged to a friend of mine named Todd. They've had that car for years. And so now I guess she wants to let this car go and this is so much fun. It's like reliving the past or something, going back to see this car 
that I haven't seen for 25 years or so, and I'm so excited to see what this car looks like now after all these years and see some old friends again. The girl moved into Springfield, lived on G Street, and Mark and I actually drove by a couple of times and uh, stopped and, you know, inquired as to if she'd ever want to sell this car, and she said no, she'd never part with it. She named the car Annie from Dreamboat Annie, the Heart album, you know, so she's got some real sentimental attachment to this car. Mark, you know her name is Annie. Her name is Annie? Yes. <laughs> Heart Barracuda Dreamboat Annie. Oh, yes. very good. <laughs> Those of you at home who own cars, a lot of times name your cars, Betsy or Old Rusty or Blue or whatever. And I just think that's cool. That just means that that thing has been not just transportation for her, but an actual family member. And it's just funny how these little cars, these little nothing cars, not just Mopar, but any car, can become a fabric in the lives of people. Anyway, we made a deal on the phone. We're just out here right now getting it loaded up. It looks exactly, it might even look a little bit better than I thought it was gonna, but it's been set in a long time, so it'll need a little bit of work to get going. But just to find a 70 Barracuda in today's world, Intact in one piece. Intact and in yeah. one piece. And allegedly will run, I believe it, the original numbers matching engine. We just unloaded it from a trailer. So we show up to Heidi's house to pick up this car. And naturally, she's got a trailer parked in front of this car. Well, it wasn't bad enough that the trailer was in front of the car, but there was an engine on an engine stand in the trailer. Mark and I have to take this six-cylinder engine and muscle this thing out onto a pallet so we can load it up in our van by hand. I wish we had our deuce on forklift for that. Once we got the trailer with the engine and everything out of the way, we were able to move the roll back into position, lower the deck on it, and get ready to load this car up. I haven't even checked this car out yet. I just know that it's a good old car and that I want it, and it's in my backyard, so I'd be an idiot not to take advantage of the entire situation. All right, Dougie, let's take a look at this old bad boy. Is she tied down? Yeah, it might be. Oh, just hook. Oh, nope. Oh, look at that. Somebody painted the grill black. <laughs> it looks familiar, don't it? <laughs> it does. <laughs> That's the first thing Dougie did to his Barracuda. Couldn't wait to paint the grill. Couldn't wait. So when we show up to see the car, the thing looked great overall. And one thing that caught my attention was the grill, which originally was argent silver, just like mine. and. They painted theirs flat black as well, and uh, that made me feel a lot better about mine, which Mark has harassed me to this day about. The rear panel was painted flat black, just like mine. It looked good. Car looked good. He wanted an AAR Cuda, and his daddy wouldn't buy him one, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. So now, when you're talking about a black grill for a 1970 Barracuda or Cuda, the only model that ever came with a black grill was the AAR, All-American Race Team car. It was a smooth, matte finish black, all right? Now, Doug's car was a Grand Coupe, so he had the bright argent silver grill and matching tail panel on it. And I gotta admit, when he did paint those black, the car really did start to stand out and look much more ominous than it did. Although, if we were to find his original car and restore it, we'd put all the argent stuff back, because now we're OE guys. Back then, we were butchers. Hey, that looks all right. White interior. It's all there. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, Dougie's in heaven now. I loved my car being a Grand Coupe because I had a full white leather interior. You know, it was different. Everybody else had black interior, whatever, but mine had white leather, and I loved it. And this car has white interior, too, and it makes it that much more appealing to me. I'm really excited to buy this car because it's so close. We know the car, we know the history on it, we know the people, and it's a unique little car with a slant six like that, a kind of a plain hamburger sleeper car. I just think it's awesome that we're in a position that we can go out, find cars like this, and buy them. In 1970, Plymouth made 179 383 four-speed convertibles. And this is one of those cars. My favorite option on this car is the hood blackout. Sorry, Will, that's actually V21. Victor 21 is the correct 
sales code for that. And it's not called hood blackout. It's called performance hood treatment. All right. You know, you're swinging a big one out there like you're the man. If you ain't the man, everybody want to be the man. Nobody want to be the man. Now, why don't you ask those questions? So when it comes to doing the blackout or the stripe, I love doing these because they really offset the car. They break up. This car in particular is orange, engine's orange. So that hood stripe's really gonna offset nicely, especially with the black top. With that being said, there's two ways to do this. We have the graveyard out there, which is a great, great reference. At this point, I'm able to take an original hood, bring it inside and get my measurements. So the first thing we do is I wanna get the measurement that's right here to this leading edge, which is about seven eighths from there to there. And I wanna see if they did the same thing on the other side, which they didn't, they did this side at three quarters. The factory didn't do them perfect. Do you wanna match it to the factory or do you wanna make it perfect? I think it's cool to do it to factory, but Mark would much rather have them perfect. So even though this is off a little bit, we'll clean it up when we go in there to actually do it. See, this is what you call a preemptive strike on old Magic Hat's part, right? He finds a factory hood that has the V21 performance treatment on it. It's as close to perfect as humanly possible. It actually, I've looked at a lot of those, and they're almost perfect, all right? But play it down. Oh, these aren't perfect. Don't expect perfect out of me if the factory couldn't get perfect. That way, when his is all off and wonky and the stripes are all over the place and he's destroyed the looks of the car, he can blame the factory hood for it. That's a preemptive strike. I've seen this movie before, all right? Now, when it does kill the entire looks of the car and the car's dead, the car's dead, I gotta explain that to the customer. And Will's gonna go back and say, roll the tape again. No, let me tell you something. My training is as a painter and not a coroner, all right? Now that's, uh, that's Gerald Olin from 1408 Sam Jackson. My training is as a manager, not a coroner. Says that to John Cusack, Mike Insulin. What is it again, the question? We got our measurements. I've written them all down exactly how they're on the hood, the original hood. Um, so we're gonna lay them out on this. They're off a little bit on the original hood, so we may make some adjustments as we go. Now what he's doing there is he wants a parade, all right? He's like, well, look at me, I got everything perfect. It's right down to the, it's, this is some angle to get a parade. Remember Kelly Robinson in I Spy? Kelly Robinson, Eddie Murphy's character? He wanted a parade. Kelly Robinson wanted a parade, right? <laughs> Ain't gonna be no parade. Just lay the stripes out. Okay, it's not rocket science. I Spy is where uh, Gondars come from. The world famous Gondars, you see a lot of hashtag Gondars. That's from me, right? I'll be in the shop just walking through and I'll say, Gondars! Gondar! <laughs> You're a real player, Mr. Gondars. Hold me close to time to dance. <laughs> right, Tiny? <laughs> you know, Mark really shouldn't be picking on me when it comes to laying these stripes out. He used to do all the stripes because if they're off a hair, they stand out so, so noticeable that I didn't, I wanted no part of them. But I've been doing it for so long now. I love the detail process of it. He knows I'm a good painter. He knows there's no reason to pick on me at all. And I execute doing these stripes to perfection every time. In the past, there's never been anybody that can lay out stripes like I can. Now that is an absolute untruth. If your rectal smoke detector is going off at home, folks, that's because Will's blowing smoke up your ass. I had a guy working for me years ago that did a beautiful job laying out the stripes. In fact, it was the very first season, uh, which you can watch over on our YouTube channel. Bunsen and burners, nice little learners. Not the point. Point being, he did a gorgeous job. It's the FC7 in Violet 70 Roadrunner. That was a two-owner car that we did for the guy that I actually ended up buying Emma's Super B from. Okay, so if you go back to then, if you watch him lay those out, they're absolutely beautiful. The only problem with that guy was, he was always jacked up on tuna, right? He had some kind of obsession with tuna. So he's always eating it out of a can, because he, he's a wannabe bodybuilder, you know, fruity pie guy, and he always, always eating, a, eating a tuna, eating tuna, protein, protein, low fat, whatever, right? But all he did was he worked his biceps. He didn't even work his neck or anything else. He, just, he had kind of a wide chest and he worked his bicep, and all the, mm, 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 like a super bodybuilder. He looked like um, Big Dog from Looney Tunes, if you watch that. 
You know, there is no do-over when you do these stripes. It's not like when you're doing a decal, if you don't like the way it lays out, you can just peel it off and start over. When it comes to painting them, you got one shot. So after I lay them all out, I double check my measurements because once it's painted, if you unmask it and something's wrong, I'm repainting the hood, I'm repainting the cowl, and I gotta start with the color and start the whole process over. So there is no do-over. It's gotta be very meticulous from start to finish. In a previous season of Graveyard Cars, this beautiful 1970 Dodge Charger in my favorite color, FK5 Burn Orange, factory 426 Hemi four-speed car was restored to perfection. How many 70 Dodge Chargers with a 426 Hemi and a manual four-speed transmission were built? Is it 16, 26, 56? If you remember or you think you know the answer, stay tuned right after the break. I'll let you know how you did. All right, ghouls, welcome back on our beautiful FK5 Burn Orange 1970 Hemi Charger RT. How many were built with a four speed? If you said 56, that is exactly right. Good job. You paid attention or you know your Mopars. And you also know this was probably one of my favorite cars of all time. The car I had when I was 16 years old was also FK5 Burnt Orange. Mine just happened to have a white top and no bumblebee stripe. This thing is a black vinyl top, white bumblebee stripe, bucket seat black interior, and to top it all off, all numbers matching. It also was one of the biggest reveals we've ever had in Graveyard Cars history. You know, I know I can't say it enough, but just really great to see the car just about all done. Real pretty. Did a great job here. Now, here's a little inside tip of the day. The reason I chose today to go up there with Doug and pick up the Barracuda is because Philly Steak's in town. Yeah, he coming in to check out the car. He calls me up, uh, da -da, I want to come check out that there car uh, a day before it's in to get here. Da -da. Oh, no, thank you. That means he's going to come in, crawl all over the car, find every minute mistake or detail error and document it like it's a big thing. So I don't need to be there for that. I don't need to have my blood pressure driven through the ceiling. While walking around the car, it was nice to see a bunch of the parts I supplied actually on the car again instead of just in a box or on my shelf. Noticing some of the things like I took liberty and I added the uh, passenger uh, racing mirror. I just feel a car looks unbalanced if it only has the one side. As bright as purple seems, it's really a darker color. So anything that's bright, like white or, or chrome, really stands out on the car. Like another thing was this car originally had a, a black vinyl top, and we opted to go with white, because the black sort of gets lost with the purple, but with the white, it just pops. Yeah, this uh, flip-top gas cap, there's an NOS one I had in stock, sent out to Mark and the guys, and they put it on the car, it looks great. NOS stands for new old stock, which means it's a brand new part that hasn't been used, but it's an old stock part which means it's old from back in the day, around period correct, 1970-ish, for this car. Some items are date coded. So NOS is a term that's misused a lot. The ones that were made in the late 70s, while they're still NOS today, they're not assembly line correct. And that's the big difference. Um, and there were certain parts that were supplied even back in 1970 that weren't correct and true to the assembly line parts because the different vendors made them. Maybe one vendor supplied the assembly lines and other vendors supplied uh, the parts chain. And also too, there's variances. Like I make the, uh, the, I make the thermostat housings. And there it is folks, the gratuitous Tony's Mopar parts plug. Can't do a bit without that. I have about 10 different examples of different fonts used and sizes on those, probably because it was such a commonly used part. This is sad, man. That's just sad. Don't see me grubbing for money on TV. <laughs> your coin, your Bunsen burners, to make some Bunsen burners, nice little learners. Uh, which you can watch over on our YouTube channel. Bunsen burners, nice little learners. You know what I'm saying? So to get those edges really nice, I use a blue fine line. It's a plastic tape. And it's the last piece that I put on there. It lays around corners very well, which you need. It doesn't lift. 
And the most important thing is it is very flexible. So you don't want to pull it because if you pull it, it'll kind of hourglass on you and make your stripes do this. So you can run that tape stripe all the way down to the edge of the hood, go right around the corner, pull just slightly, lay that tape down, run your thumb along the back side of it so you got good adhesion, go around any corners, make any pattern you want, and it'll do it without lifting. It gets kind of tricky because you get your outline done so you can see what you have. And then you have to go, okay, what goes black? What goes orange? What goes black? So what I do is I draw it out on a piece of paper and everything that goes black, I scribble in. And then I tape that piece of paper to the edge of the hood so I have a reference, because you do get kind of lost sometimes. So once I have one side done, perfect, I'm able to duplicate that on the other side and we're ready to go. Once all the taping is done, I grab my 36 inch paper, paper off all the edges. Once the paper's all done, I cut a piece of plastic, covers the rest of the car from overspray, and then at this point, I'm ready to paint it. I love this little car so much. I love the lettering on the fenders, although mine was a Grand Coupe and had the Grand Coupe crests on the fenders and the rear trunk lock. It just reminds me so much of my car. New headliner and the, the Mopar um, carpets and that box there. For some reason, it's got 72 style seats in it. I'll bet you it was a bench seat car. Yeah. You always had buckets. This is absolutely how I got it except for, you know, the years with, like... Was it always white like, interior? Yeah. yeah. This is the way you yeah. got it? Yeah, we haven't done anything to it, but by the wow. bed liner and the carpet that's in the box. Doug, if it had the wood grain inserts here and I didn't have the, your original ones, I'd say somebody put this white interior in the car. So what I'm talking about that is on the Grand Coupe, it's supposed to be the luxury addition to the Barracuda. On the trim panels, normally in this recess, it's just the vinyl. You don't see anything. It's whatever the plastic trim panel. On a Grand Coupe, they made a really neat contoured wood grain insert, and it really does richen up that interior. How about take a load off, Annie? Take a load for free. Yeah. Take a load off, Annie. 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 <laughs> Wait for it. You put the load right on me. Oh my gosh, he's trying to dance there. <laughs> it was a blue interior. I think it's pretty interesting that this car had a blue interior and they changed it out to white. My car had white interior and naturally they had to change it out to black interior. I don't understand why people can't be happy with what they have. Now we talk a lot about how this little Barracuda is similar to Doug's. That's mostly because it is just a Barracuda and not a Cuda model, which you guys see a lot of on graveyard cars. It's got the flat hood, and so that immediately brings up that uh, feeling of Doug's old car. But where Doug's car is considerably different than this car is on that fender tag. And I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far, but his was a very unique car that I believe in my heart was one of one. It was a 318, it was a four speed, FY1 lemon twist yellow, right? White leather bucket seat interior, overhead console. Yeah, my car had a lot of options. I guess I didn't appreciate it the way I would now. It did not have a vinyl top. That's why it's FY1 up higher. It was AM8 track, light group car. This thing was loaded and it was a Y14, meaning somebody actually ordered that car. So to me, in my mind, that very likely was a one of one car. And the truth is, I actually know where that car is. Taillights look great, the chrome's good on them. Real nice detailing job with the black around the taillights. Body's real nice and straight too. You know, to the good body work that was done, which was very little needed because this is all original sheet metal on the car. Tony is right about the car. Uh, this was a California car, so it wasn't rusty. There was a couple of patches in the bottom of the quarter. I think we had a small patch in the driver's floor, but the rest was good, solid, all original metal on it. The right front corner had been tapped at some point, so we had to do a little bit of work to the right inner fender, but otherwise, really great, solid car. But the rest of it's all original stuff, so it aligns like it was supposed to, and hopefully it was a lot easier to work with to get to be straight. 
Ah, the plot thickens, see? What Tony's doing right now. I, I thought it was a weird that he'd compliment the car. So what it is is Tony and I are good friends. So I just charge him my costs on stuff, right? I don't, I don't mark it up because he's my brother. He does the same thing for me, all right? So what he's doing is saying how mint condition everything was on the car. How like the car didn't need anything and it came out so flat and, and not wavy and it's just beautiful, right? That's because it's playing down. It's kind of like a wheel. It's a preemptive thing. Play it all down. So when I turn in the bill and say, listen, we had 120 body hours. Uh, how about there you have 120? Uh, hours it was a mint yeah you know condition there uh, give me another sandwich is he starting to sound like yogi a little bit hey, hey marco another liberty we took with the car cindy liked it and i like him too is the craiger wheels a liberty he says that's a really nice way of saying butchering this isn't a craiger ss it's very similar looking it's the closest thing that craiger makes to like a torque thrust wheel and uh, I like to look at these a little bit better than the SS. Now, I do have to agree with Tony on the wheel choice. First off, it's a great looking wheel, all right? This is a Krager wheel. I think it's a 610C. That means it's actually an all aluminum wheel, whereas the Krager SS has a steel outer band with the cast aluminum inner. This is actually all cast aluminum, and then it's chromed. So it's a beautiful wheel. And it's 20 lug nuts to change it out. So it's not like you change the top from black to white, and now you have to redo half the car to fix it. Butcher. God, I wish Darren was here to see this. He would just have a field day with it. Where's the shifter booter? What's the deal? Didn't restore the car, Darren. Is this missing some trim here? He wanted those taken off. What's the deal with the tips? He wanted the 71 to 74 tips on it. So as usual, you never quite finish them even when they go. No, I no, didn't Darren, get paid to do a restoration. Right. It's a collision job. I understand that. And this was an NOS mirror I sent him out for the driver's side also. There's another liberty I took, a couple really on the interior. Another Liberty? Ellis Island doesn't have that many Liberties. I don't understand why didn't we just build him a tribute car? He could have saved a bunch of money and invested in a sandwich shop or something. It's just, you know, what's happening? It was a bucket seat car with a six way seat, which is nice, but there's nothing more comfortable than a bench seat and an E-body. And the only way you could get that from the factory is if it was a column shift car. While the column shift car is somewhat boring, you could say, and we change interior color to white instead of black for the same reason that I mentioned prior for just the white just stands out so much nicer. <laughs> He's gonna pick on me for not having a washer underneath the wing nut on the pie tin. And he's changed the interior from black six-way bucket seats to a white bench. Physician heal thyself, right? <laughs> I don't wanna get all biblical on everybody, but come on, man. Luke 4.23. Most of the time when you're sitting in an e-body, you feel like you're in a hole and like you're a little guy looking behind the steering wheel. With the bench seat, you sit so much taller. You have much better uh, vision and view. Uh, I also added the, the tough wheel on the car. Oh, a tough wheel. A tough wheel. Good call. Mind if I just check the sales option code book real quick here? S84, S84. Hmm, I don't see the S84 option in the 1970 e-body. That is so weird. <laughs> the tough wheel is actually a smaller diameter than the standard wheel, so it makes the steering ratio seem quicker. The instrument cluster is beautiful on this. Instrument specialties did a real nice job. You know, we stayed with the black headliner instead of white just for cleaning purposes. And very happy to see it done, and very happy to see the progress. Long time waiting. Here we go again with another Liberty I took. Another Liberty. <laughs> it was originally a black body side molding car, and we opted to go with the white stripe. Again, it stands out. It just looks really good and ties all the white in together. You know, looking at the front of the car, the grill is just gorgeous. Such a nice job on that. I believe they restored the original grill, and Cindy will be real happy when she sees it. It was a bench seat car originally. Oh! What? It was a bench seat car originally. I love it. I think the bench seat is so intriguing to us now because all the cars we do are bucket seat console shift cars. Whether they even started life that way, that's the way we see them now at the car shows. I think they look like a bucket seat from the front and from the back. It isn't until you look down and see that they're not actually separated that you realize it's a bench seat. 
924, October 24th is when it was born, 1969. V5X, you know what it used to have on it? Those ugly body side moldings. You know, these body side moldings, the, the V5X, they were really popular. I understand that the point behind them was to save door dings on the side of the car, but it's ugly. So what would you rather have, a few door dings on the side of your car or this ugly molding that looks worse than any door ding in the world? If you look at our green car, the 70 Challenger RTSE that we did a few seasons ago, it had that, it had got to put it back on. It's an original numbers matching car. Tony's car had it. He didn't opt to put it back on because he took a liberty <laughs> to get rid of that. You know, this little Barracuda really didn't have any options on it. It was probably the cheapest car on the lot back in the day. Yeah, no vinyl top, it had a bench seat, column shift, it was a slant six. I mean, it really was a stripper car. Somebody must have found a 72 Cuda with a white interior and took the liberty, if you will, <laughs> of installing it in that car. You see what I did there with the liberty? It's a story arc. Okay, that's an arc. Saw it a lot in Seinfeld. Liberty. In a very early season of Graveyard Cars, we restored this gorgeous one of one 1970 Dodge Challenger and FC7 Plum Crazy loaded with options. True or false, this car was a four speed. If you remember the car and you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. All right, ghouls, welcome back. How did you do on that one? The question was, true or false, our rare sunroof option 1970 Dodge Challenger was a factory four-speed. If you said, yes, you're wrong, that car was an automatic on the floor with console. This car to date was one of the most loaded cars we've done. We're talking houndstooth interior, rim blow steering wheel, luggage rack, V21 performance hood treatment, black vinyl top, power sunroof, front and rear bumper guards. This thing was loaded. It's, it's nice to actually see the parts on a car instead of just having them as parts. The original battery cables. Nice thing is on the positive cable, there's distinct different color between the, the two different cables on there that the reproductions don't have. And even the later service, uh, the NOS service parts didn't have either. Um, both of those cables, the negative also is, uh, is NOS. Along with the voltage regulator, that's an NOS voltage regulator dated correctly for the car. Even the distributor, it's an NOS distributor. Did a nice job with that. Another thing that's in your face part is the, uh, the upper hose. That's a correct original NOS upper hose. Real busy under the hood. I've never really had a lot of cars with air conditioning, but it takes up a lot of room. A couple things Mark made mistakes, but it's okay. That's why I'm here to help correct them. And we're off to the races. Let the games begin. The finish is wrong on the uh, hood latch, the primary hood latch. It should be more of a brownish, greenish color. He can get that replated. And also, he, he neglected to put the uh, washer underneath the wing nut for the pie tin. All the original cars had a, a washer underneath there. Uh, so when you spin the nut down, it wouldn't uh, tear up the paint on the pie tin. Why don't you change that their interior over to white? Why don't you put a white top instead of a black top? Let's add a white stripe to it. Let's put a right-hand mirror on it. It's going to be fun. Don't forget that washer, it's a wee, it's a wee, that there is a wee. But still need a couple finishing things. Obviously the wipers aren't on yet and the seal on top of the cowl. But that's just a quick minute to get those assembled on the car. Real pretty looking, real nice, I'm happy to see it. It also has an NOS uh, heater control valve I had sent them out and looks like it's working because it's holding pressure. Wiper motor also, that was a new old stock wiper motor. I had a lot of these parts I just keep in case it ever comes to the point where I need them for a car. Then if the opportunity arises like this car did, I wanted to put the right stuff on it. Not that Cindy will care when she's driving it, but I care and they bother me, so that's why I do it. Yeah, I, I've got to ask uh, Tony D'Agostino, the sandwich man, if those wheels are supposed to be blue like that. Now what I'm talking about is a standard issue wheel. So if you didn't option any other wheels on this car, you would have got a wheel painted body color with a little poverty cap in the middle of it. In this case, 
We have a wheel that appears to be painted body color from the factory, but it has a full wheel cover on it. I think somebody found those and put it on. That's just what I wanted to confirm with Tony. I think originally it had the dog dish center cap, which I think is a really neat looking wheel. That's the original carpet in there. Somebody took apart a 15 years two Barracuda. I've owned it since 87. And yeah. I don't know, due to the math, I've owned it 30. See, there's the original door armrest pad. I love it. I do too. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. So, I think we ought to load this thing up. I ought to give her some money, and we ought to get her loaded up. What do you think? I still think it's great to be able to do, after all these years, what we did as kids. We don't see eye to eye all the time, but we get along, and we enjoy working on these cars again after all these years. I think we are so lucky. You know, I'm asked this a lot. Did I ever think that graveyard cars would be doing what we're doing now? And you know, I had no idea what would happen with graveyard cars when I had the idea. I hoped that it would be a fun show. I never dreamed, and if somebody had said something when I was a kid, I still wouldn't have dreamed that it would be where it's at today. To be able to work on the greatest cars that I have loved and drooled over my entire life, and to be able to go out with my cousin and hang out as much as he makes me crazy, and be able to buy these cars and bring them back and offer them to somebody as a as their dream car. So it's definitely better than anything I could have dreamed of or hoped for. I believe it was John Lennon that said, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. And for me, that's true. However, John also said that I am the Eggman, I am the walrus, so I'm not sure what to believe. That uh, was Tim Canterbury from The Office BBC. So. When we finished loading up the Barracuda, I called back to Will and just asked if Sandwich Man was still around. He said he was still there, and I'm quoting Will now, crawling up its ass with a flashlight, unquote. So I'm gonna borrow a branch from the Super Tramp tree and take the long way home. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, it's nice to see the car done, or very, very close to being done. There's a couple of little things that still need to be assembled on the car, like the support bracket from the lower radius support to the K-frame. One of the uh, liberties we t I took with the car was putting a fast ratio steering in it. Did you know that Lady Liberty wears a size 879 shoe? It makes it so much nicer to drive, and hence the longer pitman arm with the fast ratio right on it. Beautiful exhaust system, uh, that's from ECS, and I think this is the only uh, one that Mark said that they actually welded the uh, the resonators right to the head pipes, which was the way how the factory did it. It was welded together as one piece. Real nice overspray on the underbody of the car to duplicate the factory on top of the gray prime. It just really blew under from the outsides of the car randomly, whatever got from the outside of the car when they were painting it on the assembly line. One of the things I had them do on this car was, this wasn't an undercoat car. This car didn't have any factory undercoating. It was a California car. It was assembled in Los Angeles plant. So because it didn't have undercoating, the way how these cars were built, the body of the car went through a big vat. And on original cars, you can see the line where that stopped uh, around midway up through the kick panels. So on this car, I wanted it to be like that. So I was really busting Will's chops when he was painting it, sending him pictures of how it should be in original cars and one of my restored cars. I said, you gotta copy this. You know, I'm gonna be painting your ass on this. So when it comes to the undercoating on Tony's car, and I love you, Tony. I hope you're watching this at home. It's the weird things. Because I'm the paint guy, I was like, man, he's gonna come in with his filly and just bust my balls over the paint. So I just made sure it looks so good. And it looks so good, I didn't even get a thank you. It just looked that great. He didn't say a word. I had to ask for a compliment. But when it came to the undercoating, the part that just doesn't matter, I mean, I had to sample product after product after product, and then four more products. Then he sent over the schematics of how it needs to be applied, what areas, and it, it was miserable. So what they did was they, you know, primed the whole car like they normally would but not do anything else. And then when they paint the body, just blow purple underneath the car, whatever got there. And it doesn't have to match left to right because they didn't do that from the factory either. So they copied that and it shows really nice in the car. Got all the drips on the torsion bars, just like they did from the factory because 
They weren't painted, they were dipped into a big vat. There's a California car, emissions car, so that's why it has the third line for the vapor return to their fuel tank. Actually, Rain Man, that is not a vapor return line, okay? The vapor return line was used in 1968 to 1972 on all 440 and 426 Hemis with 3 8 main fuel line and a quarter inch vapor return line. What he's talking about is an N95 evaporative emission. So, oh snap! <laughs> you know, coming all at me and stuff. That's crazy, man. Lost his damn mind. Here's the resonators that are welded on. Actually, the weld job that was done duplicates the factory. And these are very nice resonators licensed by Chrysler with the Pentastar and all the markings on them. And if you notice these uh, rear lower shock plates, they drop the shock down a little bit more than every other car except for 70E body and 70C body. I don't know why the reasoning of it was, but I know it's specific to this car. Another liberty we took with the car was Hey, did you know that France gave us the Statue of Liberty originally? That's, that's damn nice of them. That's two gifts, right? Statue of Liberty, Lady of Liberty, and a French fry. We added a, a factory rear sway bar that wasn't available on the 440 or Hemi cars, but came on the 340 and 383 cars starting sometime after the AARs and TAs were built. And it really helps the car just drive that much nicer with the rear sway bar. And it just, between that and the fast ratio steering box, you know, in the modern radials, it feel more like a modern car driving down the road instead of a 50-year-old wanderer. These are what they call Q-clamps, where most muffler clamps or ex exhaust clamps have two studs sticking down with two nuts on them, and that's fine, except for when you're trying to line up an exhaust tip, you know, you're having two hands holding on the clamp, you can't center the exhaust tip to be exactly where it should be. And it's really critical on the E-bodies because they have to fit into the rear valance. It's a one-bolt deal, so you would hold the uh, exhaust tip with one hand, and use the other hand to tighten up the bolt. Okay, so we got the whole entire car masked up, ready to go. It's all scuffed, sanded, everything looks really good. I'm gonna tack it off, make sure, because you can't cut and buff flat. So the way it comes out is the way it comes out. So we're gonna spray it, everything looks good. It'll sit in here overnight, then I'll kick it back to assembly, and I'm done with this car. So when it comes to cutting and buffing, especially I mean, we do it on all the cars. It takes care of you know, any dirt nibs, imperfections. Honestly, I mean, I very seldomly will I have a run. It does happen. But you know, you, you just do all the paintwork cleanup in the cut and buff on a car that's either single stage or base coat, clear coat. When it comes to doing flat black or any matte finish, it's a little more tedious because the way it comes out is how it comes out. You can't have dirt, you can't have a run because if you sand it it's all, and then buff it, it's gonna be shiny. So you got one shot to do the flat black, tack and blow it, wax and grease it, blow the booth out, blow yourself out. You walk out of the booth and you're done. And it's gotta look that way. The stripe process went really well. Came out perfect, looks amazing. It's just a very tedious process and I learned I can't be filmed the whole time while trying to get measurements. It's too distracting and too much of a pain in the butt. So just making sure this, the stripes are, are done perfect just takes so much time but they look amazing. Got it over here for Justin to assemble and we can walk away from this car at this point.